like to take you to Mars. I have two goals. Talk about becoming interplanetary as a species, the human species, and regenerating spaceship Earth. So we'll go to Mars, and we're going to come back to Earth. I'm really excited to be here today. I think all of exploration has three fundamental questions. Just three. Are we alone in the universe? Are there other habitable planets? And is there life? And when are we going to find it? Life elsewhere in the universe. Because that'll help us think about life here on Earth. This is celestial fireworks. You're watching an image of the Wesselsland II cluster. 3,000 new stars are being formed here. So let's explore first out into the solar system and then lessons for Earth. Earth and Mars, sister planets, 4.5 billion years old each. Life worked out pretty well here for us on Earth. Our life support system, we're protected by our global magnetic field. Mars, mm, not so lucky. Today, it doesn't have a global magnetic field. Half the size of Earth, it's spectacular. Earth. Spaceship Earth, that's my number one planet. Mars, number two. Why Mars? Because we're looking for the evidence of life. When we say look for life in the universe, we say follow the water. We know that Mars has ice on its north and south poles. Recently, we found seasonal water. All the building blocks for life are on Mars. Carbon, methane, hydrogen. Mars today, not protected by a global magnetic field, has a 1% carbon dioxide atmosphere. The plants are going to love it. But Earth and Mars, 4.5 billion years old each, now Mars at 3.5 billion years ago probably lost its atmosphere. Why? The sun's wind, the radiation, the solar wind bombarding Mars, ionizing that atmosphere. So when we talk about Earth and planet and climate, we can study all of the planets. So. Everyone in here who's a, a student, raise your hand. All right, class participation. You're the Mars generation, and you're going to be boots on Mars in the 2030s. So I have two decades to work with you. We need to design the suits and the ships to get us there. We've been to the moon. We're going back. These are my Apollo bloopers. Not great to do science in, but that's the world's smallest spacecraft. It provides your pressurization, your oxygen. We shrink a spacecraft around you and let you explore other worlds. In the middle, shout out, Katie Coleman is here. Astronaut Katie Coleman is training in the current spacesuit. That's 140 kilos. Not too bad when she's in space station because it's weightless. But that's not the kind of system we want to go to Mars with. It's really massive, it's really heavy, and it's not mobile. So, we've kind of flipped the design paradigm. I'd like to introduce our MIT biosuit, and we have a special guest and model. You know Rucha, but maybe you don't know her as the Mars Generation Explorer. <laughs> Rucha's in our, our biosuit mock-up. She's mobile, she's flexible, no more 140 kilos. Our goal is 20 kilos. She can bend down because she has to be like that Olympic athlete, that extreme explorer on Mars, because Olympus Mons is three times the mount size of Mount Everest. Valles Marineris, it stretches across the whole United States, 10 times the Grand Canyon. So exploration on Mars is extreme. I think we'll probably find the evidence of past life or perhaps organic life in the next decade. How do we design the suit? Our research enables studying human performance, enabling humans. We flip that design paradigm. So we take, can I make a second skin suit? Can I look at Rucha's flexibility, her athleticism, and design a suit for her, not shrink a spacecraft around her in gas pressurization? I want her to move. So we take a look. It literally is a second skin design. You're looking at a skin strain map. You need about 40% stretch here for her elbows to give her maximum mobility. And if I put infinitesimal circles on her skin, and she moves, has all that flexibility, that circle will turn into an ellipse. That circle will turn elliptical as she moves. There's a special pair, those red bisecting diameters. When she moves, they pivot. They do not extend. 
They're called the lines of non-extension, and that's how we end up with a Spider-Man looking suit. We've been working on this longer than the Spider-Man movies have been out. But that's how we get this beautiful aesthetic design. It's really three-dimensional eigenvector mathematics. We're at MIT, I can say that. Three-dimensional eigenvector mathematics. All of my students get that. And that's really the materials. We have to apply the pressure. A third of an atmosphere, 30 kilopascals. We look at the patterning to make sure she has mobility and flexibility. Why, again, searching for the evidence of life on Mars, but let's take it home now back to Spaceship Earth. Thank you. Because this is the only one we have. We are all astronauts, we're all the crew, and we're on Spaceship Earth. We're going about 30 kilometers per second, pretty fast. That would've been great for my commute this morning. I could've gotten here in a second, because we are in orbit in the sun. But let's take a look at our Earth-observing satellites, 20 Earth-observing satellites looking down on Earth, eyes on Earth, to look at temperature in the atmosphere to look at our oceans, to look at our agriculture, to look at clouds, to look at all of Earth's systems, oceans, land, and air. We have a very special vantage point from space looking down at Earth. The goal then, I think Bucky Fuller said it best, simple, it's audacious, it's to make the world work for 100% of humanity through spontaneous cooperation in the shortest amount of time without any ecological offense to anyone, any living being. So, we're on it. It's a big task. I'd like to show you Earth's vital signs. Our exploring in the universe, looking for life, we bring that back, we bring our satellite data down to Earth. Earth is speaking to us. My question is, are we listening? This is temperature data from 1880 through current time. Blue and white is one to two degrees below a running average mean. Yellow and orange is one to two degrees Celsius above an average, a 30-year average, 1950 to 1980. So 30-year global average, 1960s, 1970s. Raise your hand if you're born in the 70s, the 80s. Here comes all the students, the Mars generation, the 90s, 2000s. It's hot. 2016 was the hottest year ever recorded. 2017 was the second year. Guess what my prediction is for 18 and 19. We're setting records for each month now. You know the data. The goal was two degrees Celsius. We've already reached one degree. No, now the goal is 1.5 degrees Celsius. Let me take a look at the carbon dioxide, Earth's vital signs. This is literally trapped greenhouse gas. These are our emissions. This is the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. A year in the carbon dioxide cycle. We don't want to be orange and yellow. That's above 400 parts per million. Blue, blue's good. It's less than 400 parts per million. So I'm gonna show you five, 10, 15, 20 kilometers up into the atmosphere. This is human caused. These are our emissions of carbon. Also fires, also volcanoes, but that's primarily human caused. So that is a view of trapped greenhouse gases. But I know you're bummed out, but don't be bummed out, because I'm optimistic. We can do something about this. This is within our power. This is the vital signs of Earth. I'm just showing you how the patient's doing. One last vital sign. I'd like to take a look at our glaciers, at our fresh water, because Greenland and Antarctica hold 99% of the world's fresh water trapped in glaciers. I had a chance to go to Antarctica and do science and go to the South Pole and run around the South Pole Took three seconds, it was really cold. Uh, we sailed our boat around the world, that took 18 months. So exploring Earth and looking around, there's a reason Antarctica is not populated. It's a beautiful continent, but it is cold and harsh, and there is definitely reason Mars is not populated. It's 100 times worse than Antarctica. So we take our airplanes, our satellite data, looking down at the ice. We fly airplanes every summer to Greenland to take a look at this ice sheet. How's Greenland doing? Not great, about 300 gigatons of ice lost in just one year. Couple that with 125 gigatons from the Antarctic ice sheet, we're over 400 gigatons of ice lost. Well, how big is that? Well, that's three times the size of Texas. So that's what's happening to our atmosphere, to our oceans, to our ice. But I'm optimistic, why? Because all the students, can you raise your hand again? Because the Mars generation, because they get it, they get it and we need to empower them, and we need to put Earth in our hands. 
just in your iPhone, right? I wake up every day. I say, hey, Earth, how are you doing? Mm, David, not too good, running a fever. I can't go into MIT with you, one degree hot. Okay, what can I do? What can I do? Because I've shown you global data, but it's really at the regional and personal actions. I'm optimistic because all my students are, are on this, and they're great. And I call them the Mars generation, and the Mars generation is on this, but we all have to work together through spontaneous cooperation to start accelerating change for the Earth, because we only have one decade. I think we only have one decade. I still have two decades to get to Mars, and we'll do it. But when we look at our oceans, these are just the big five challenges. Warming, sea level rise, acidification, overfishing. We can all do something. So don't be overwhelmed. I'm not overwhelmed. I'm not going to say, what can I do today? Just one little thing. OK, I took the train in at 7 AM. That's something we can do. You can all do it. I don't have the solution for you. We all need our own dashboards. What, what you know, I can give you all the data in the world. But what makes you act? What makes you change? That's the really tough problem. That's what we're working on. Taking the data, curating that data, using artificial intelligence. My student Brandon's here. He's using GANs. Synthesize that data to show people the future. Show them a positive future if we start accelerating positive action for the Earth. So the overview effect was an aerospace biomedical engineer like me. Well, now I wake up every day and I say, What's the most important thing I can be working on today? And my answer is Spaceship Earth, because I love this planet so much and all of you on it. And um, Earth doesn't need us. We really need Earth. Thank you very much.